I remember when it kind of first started off, um, a group of us were just out to, out to dinner and we very darkly, you know, sort of said, who's, who's going to be next? And we, you know, chatted and came up with a list of about seven people and within six months, all of them were gone. Do you see yourself as kind of like one of the early YouTubers? Uh, I don't. I don't really see myself as an early YouTuber. I, I still consider myself third generation, which means nothing to anyone except me. Uh, but the, kind of the first generation YouTubers were literally the the people that were on there when the site first kind of booted up in in, in two thousand five. I mean, the most subscribed YouTuber at one point was a eighty something year old British guy called Geriatric nineteen twenty seven. Uh, like he's a first generation YouTuber, and the next would be. Um, second generation people kind of coming on, showing up in around about 2006, like Amazing Phil. Um, and then I, I consider myself third because I started posting in, I think, 2007. But uh, I've been putting stuff on the internet since 2001 or two. I think I was about 11 or 12 and I typed in uh, the word stupid and then .com because that's how you'd browse the internet back then. Just random word, .com, see what shows up. And I saw my first ever online cartoons. And I immediately went, oh, this is what I want to, do, want to do for the rest of my life. Just in that moment, just went, yep, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and everything was kind of building towards that. But yeah, so in about 2008, when YouTube rolled out the partner program, which enabled you to make money, I'd already had this kind of understanding of uh, the six, seven years on the internet, figuring out what people liked. So I, I put all these things that I thought I understood together into this little two minute cartoon called Astaf Movie. Uh, and obviously that failed miserably. And this interview isn't happening, so. <laughs> Tell my children I love them! Daddy! Ah. No! <laughs> my motivation was never uh, financial, at least at that stage. Now everything is driven by money. Oh my God, I have a mortgage. Uh, but no, at that point it was just, oh neat. Oh money, cool. Because I, I just turned 18 uh, at the point they rolled it out as well. So, you know, even money wasn't too much of a concept. I was just studying university. So um, it was just a nice, a nice bonus. I signed up to the program and, you know, you only got paid once you'd made $100. Um, and so, you know, from the time I became a partner, so the, the first paycheck I got was still a few months um, to make that first $100. And I remember getting that check and that being a big moment. But it was only in, in the sort of the last months of me being at university. So at the point I'd been a partner about three years that I was making enough money to be like, oh, okay, this is a thing. Great, brilliant, really convenient because I was finishing uni and I already had this sort of like full-time uh, revenue stream. Did you feel an amount of pressure then? It, it didn't really change much pressure-wise because I wasn't even considering money real, I guess. There was no fear. It was all just so, wow, this is all just happening. So I was just throwing myself into it and not worrying about it, you know. Um, and, and for this sort of year after that happened, I was on such a high that I was just churning out just so many videos that were just doing really well. I mean, videos that were getting a million views in, in sort of 20, 24, 48 hours, which was more impressive back then. Um, and yeah, just dropping things every, every week or, or, or two. And it was just a, an absolutely bonkers time. I was, I was very, just very just excited and it was a lot of fun then. And how would you describe your style back then? American. Um, I would describe my style as, well, I'd, I'd call it explosive comedy, which was just quite Americanized. So you did have a lot of that sort of British uh, dry wit and sarcasm, but then someone would explode and scream and, and stuff. So yeah, it was quite heavily inspired by, you know, on one hand, Monty Python, sure, but then just sort of American ridiculous loudness. Uh, yeah, my audience was just sort of, uh, you know, US by just logically there were so many of them uh, and then then the UK and then Australia, Canada, sort of all these English speaking places. I think the next would be Germany, which really surprised me. But the Germans, they love they love those little cartoons. I don't know why I uh, thought the, the whole thing was that they didn't have a sense of humor. I don't know if that's a reflection on me, actually, um, but they, they bloody love them. <laughs> I remember seeing your kind of stickers and t-shirts and stuff like that quite early on. Was merch a thing when, and you were copying it or was it something you were thinking, oh, I could do this and kind of pushing out on your own? Yeah, there was, 
in, in sort of earlier YouTube, there were so many sort of taboos that we had to, it's it, 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 a thanklessly pioneer, as it were, like merchandise and, and sponsorships because it was considered selling out. People had, this term sell out was, you don't really hear it, to be honest anymore, because it's just kind of a given. But you know, if a YouTuber would suddenly start releasing t-shirts with, with, with their, their face or quotes from their videos, it'd be like, oh, you're a sellout. Uh, but I always figured that selling out was compromising, you know, your integrity and doing something you wouldn't normally do specifically in the pursuit of, of fame and money. So, you know, if, if, if a brand was, was giving me a nice budget uh, and I got to make a huge, uh, you know, a huge production value sketch, just I had to center around Oreos. I didn't see that as selling out. I, was, I thought that was awesome because um, I got to bring more exciting, you know, videos to people. And, and yeah, hey, thanks, Oreo, for, you know, I'm not forcing you to buy Oreos. It's just, hey, Oreo paid for this. Isn't that cool? Uh, and people go, yeah, that is cool. And that was, that was great. It was a great uh, relationship. And, um, but yeah, you, there'd be a lot of pushback at the time and a, a lot of uh, anger towards it. Um, and, I mean, hell, there was a point where putting ads on your videos would make people angry. Just, just enabling adverts would get caught, you called a sellout. And now, yeah, people will start a video, say, hey, check out my new, new tour. I got some new merch. Uh, but first, here's 40 seconds about uh, HelloFresh. Uh, and also, you just watched two unskippable pre-rolls. There's a mid-roll every two minutes on this video. And hell, we'll just throw some more ads at the end as well. Why not? So, and that, and people don't even get mad about that. They, they just accept that now. And that's great for us, I guess. But uh, yeah, it, it wasn't enviable to be someone trying to trailblaze that, as it were. A thankless task. The first sponsored video I ever got was, was in, in 2010, uh, and it was for Marmite. Uh, and it was just some minor player at, at, at an ad agency that had been given a, a, probably like about a 500,000 pound budget and, and tasked with reaching out to, you know, what would later be called influencers. Um, and, and, you know, this, this person reached out and said, oh, did you do a video for Marmite? And I was like, okay, I'll do, I'll, how much are you paying? And they're like, oh, 100 pounds, ooh, yippee. Uh, I was 19, that was great. Uh, I could buy a whole, some pizzas with that. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I took on this job and I made this, this, this video for, um, for Marmite. You know, there was no contract, there were no agreements. There was no, oh, you have to say this and, uh, and you can't monetize the video. So I, I released this video. I think it has something like 20 million views now. And I've had ads on that the whole time. So I got my money back in the end. Marmite, what are you doing? I'm sleeping with your wife, John. It, yeah, you are. Um, you know, incorporating the brand in the creative way and having fun with it is still more enjoyable uh, than just knowing you're just kind of being talked at. When you talk about not getting paid for brands, not wanting to do brands, you seem like you're very sort of relaxed and quite easygoing about it. Do you feel that way? I have a lot of grey hair. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it, it's an act. Uh, I'm not relaxed at all. I'm extremely stressed all the time. I overthink absolutely everything. Uh, and, but it's fun just to recount it and, and laugh about it. But no, we overthink absolutely everything to a ridiculous degree. That's why I'm one of the many creators that has experienced varying degrees of burnout. First time I experienced burnout was, I think, in 2009. Uh, I, I tried for uh, about a four-month period to release weekly videos. Wow, weekly videos. Uh, and it was a nightmare. It was just too much. I couldn't handle it. I mean, I, did, I had to be fair, I had no crew or anything. It was just me making videos and stuff, but it was trying to make high production value comedy sketches and stuff. But yeah, that, that was the first time I experienced burnout. Um, and it, it really just felt like the end of the world at the time, like I'd failed. Um, the next time would be uh, a few years later uh, when I just, during that sort of big UK YouTuber boom, uh, when suddenly there were so many more eyes on, so much more excitement, and, and I was making loads of content in, in quite a, a manic, just churning it out state. Um, but that, you know, you know, like pulling an all-nighter, you, you, you pay the piper eventually, and, and uh, I became burnt out. And yeah, that 2013 burnout uh, is going on nine years now. Around about 2018, um, I very much felt like I, I didn't have anything more to do or say, um, that I was really just scraping the bottom of the barrel of what I had left to kind of offer the world content-wise. I mean, in 2018, I started a series called Content, which in itself was was me just going, oh, f it, uh, here's just some stuff. And uh, I put together this music video um, 
as sort of a, a, a tying off of a Astaf movie uh, called The Muffin Song. And in, in that video, you know, I kind of touch on themes of, of, of burnout and, and depression, you know, because that's what you want, your little funny cartoon. And yeah, I put that out and it, it got about 30 million views and it was, it was well received, but it was, it was sort of my way of saying, I, th I think that's it, I think that's all I have to offer. And then TikTok picked up the video and initially it was just some people doing these quite uh, cringe, uh, is what it's called, uh, videos, um, you know, lip syncing to it and then it was getting memed on a lot. And then that evolved into people enjoying it unironically and, you know, very quickly, I think within the year that song went gold uh, and is on, it's well on its way to going platinum. The video how has well over 200 million views, I think, and it just suddenly bought me a, a whole new lease of relevancy. But make no mistake, I've, I've been considering that borrowed time ever since. Um, you know, we, we decided to ride this, this, this wave of popularity from the Muffin Song. We made, we made a card game called Muffin Time, and that also did really well, and we just kept making stuff. And, and this, for about four years now, my mentality has been, I'm just gonna keep making stuff while I'm allowed to, uh, because I did not expect to still be able to do this. Um, so it is, you know, whereas it used to be this desperate cling to, to relevance and, and growth, uh, it is now more, more of just a, a grateful like, oh neat, people are still paying attention. You've played around with lots of different types of video and content. Um, why is that? Uh, I've often described myself as consistently inconsistent. Um, that's just something that I've kind of told people to get used to. Uh, one thing that I've, I've, I saw on the internet, even before YouTube, uh, is that, you know, a creator will get massive success with one video and then just go, okay, I will just keep doing that. Um, and this is something that's with a platform like TikTok is I think even worse. I think that's, you can really see these numbers, you know, a TikToker will do one thing that gets a laugh and then they will just keep doing it again. And if they don't, you can just see this like absolute black and white, you know, 10 million views and the next the video they don't do it in has a hundred views. And then they do it again, there's 10 million views again. And, and so it, it can be brutal, but like I saw that trap before I even started posting on YouTube and I really did not want to get sucked into it. So even when I made the Asta movie uh, video and, and that did really well, I, I didn't then just go, okay, I'm gonna do two, three, four, five. I mean, I did do those, but I made sure to put a year between them. Um, and, and in between them, I would put out other things, you know, longer cartoons and, and, and comedy sketches and, and even at some points, short films and, and stuff because I really wanted to just make a lot of different stuff. And, and if I wanted an audience there, I wanted them to um, just enjoy a variety of things. Weirdly, the most fun I have these days is, is doing sponsor segments for brands because I get to really just cut loose and make the wackiest stuff uh, and the, the pressure isn't nearly as high as it is anywhere else. Uh, but don't get me wrong, as soon as, uh, as soon as it dries up, I'm out of London. I'm gone. I'm going home. I'm going to settle down, get some more dogs. People know about comments online. Was that something that affected you on, or something that you could kind of take in your stride? Oh yeah, it was bad. It was really bad. Um, I was extremely susceptible to comments. I mean, the way it's, it's kind of always worked uh, for a lot of creators, I think, is that you know that, that one negative comment outweighs a hundred positive ones. Uh, my theory is always that it's basically it's because you agree with that negative comment more. They're just confirming your own insecurities. But yeah, no, the comments have always been a thing. Although, weirdly, they're fine now. Um, I think that uh, because I've just been around so long, there's, there's, there's not that kind of excitement. No one feels the need to tear me down. But when I was younger and, and more enthusiastic and, um, and popular, to be honest, um, there's just this sort of natural need to, to tear that person down. And I'll still have that if, if I have a video that suddenly does really well and leaves my sort of bubble of my audience, you'll, you'll suddenly start getting an influx of nasty comments. That's actually the best way to tell that a video is doing well, um, is, is that people start being mean. You know, you start to rise in YouTube and then there's kind of a group of British YouTubers. There was a big scene uh, that sort of collapsed in on itself, uh, centered around Alex Day. Wow. He's definitely involved, sure. Would you mind talking us through that a little bit? Yeah, so around in, in 2013, 2014, there was a, the best thing you can describe it as a purge um, in the UK YouTube scene, where basically a lot of, of, of creators 
all male as far as I'm aware, uh, were just kind of found to be doing a lot of predatory things and they were getting systematically turfed out. Um, and it was all um, open secrets because we knew that there were all these creators who were very predatory and, and, and would be you know, sexually inappropriate with their fans or just generally not good people, but there's not really much you can do about it because it's not your story to tell. They can just sue you. Um, so all you could really do is wait for people to come forward with things you knew were true and then amplify that. And that was sort of the, the, the play, uh, really. I remember when it kind of first started off, um, a group of us were just out to, out to dinner and we very darkly, you know, sort of said, who's, who's going to be next? And we, you know, chatted and came up with a list of about seven people and within six months, all of them were gone. You'd see this again in, in sort of a few years with, with the Me Too movement. Basically, what we saw in Me Too it had it happened beat by beat in the UK YouTube scene. And it was just very weird um, and grim. And I, I wish more people knew about it almost because I do worry that it's just gonna happen again now. Logically, it just will. Um, the, you know, the, the same, the, the same thing will just happen in the sort of the TikTok world where you have a lot of new, pretty young people getting loads of attention suddenly and having the opportunities to abuse that attention and, you know, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it and all that. So I do hope it doesn't happen again. I really do. If you met someone now at a convention, a young person who's thinking about starting a channel for the first time, what would you say to them? Oh, I do. Uh, and for a while I would say don't, uh, because I was really miserable. That's a miserable little d And I'd be like, just don't do it. Um, what I would, oh gosh. I mean, the thing is it's, it's shifted so much. What it means to be uh, famous on the internet has changed so much over the years that I almost wouldn't be able to tell someone what to expect because fame looks so different now. On, on, on YouTube, I had such a slow, steady growth um, over the course of years. And even though I did have a big boom at one point, that boom was only getting like a million subscribers within a year. Comparatively now, kids are getting a million followers on TikTok in a week or, or, or so. And that's unfathomable. I can't imagine the mental weight of that. I was at a convention last year and I was on a panel with a bunch of other creators and the question went around, when did you start posting videos? Um, and it's worth noting all of these creators had similar numbers to me, you know, followers in the millions. And every single one of them had started posting the year prior in 2020. That was just, that was mad. That was, just, and the scariest thing about that was they had no idea what they were talking about. Um, and I don't mean that to be rude, but it was just they had not had the, the necessary growth and humbling and experience that you get uh, when you have a large audience. And the, m m the biggest thing is responsibility. Um, you know, you need to learn that when you, you're an influencer, they, that term exists for a reason and it's an appropriate term. If you tell people what to do or what to think, they will do that. They'll believe you. They see you as a, as a authority figure. So I, I have to choose which brands I work with and I choose carefully. I, I won't work with um, like alcohol brands. And I've had plenty of alcohol brands approach me and just offered wild amounts of money that I would love to take. But I know that my audience is young and susceptible and I'm not gonna promote it to them. If I had an older audience say, yeah, that, no problem, but I know my audience and therefore I, I know the responsibility I have to them. Even if you are a 17 year old and you think there's no way anyone is gonna be, uh, I have any power or responsibility, you're wrong. You do, because the people your age and younger and even older are listening to you and viewing you as an authority figure and they respect you and they are taking what you say literally, even if you don't want them to and that is an intense responsibility. Please wield it carefully. If I started making videos where Uncle Roger is saying things like, oh, I'm Asian, I love eating dog, that would be a problem, right? But to the people who accuse me of uh, that, that character being a racist caricature, I would say, I would urge them to actually listen to the, the things I'm saying and see that everything I say is lifting our people up.